yeah. one. <laughs> you know, that's that's that's. Yeah, we were talking about that before, actually. So, uh, don't feel too bad about <laughs> not being overrun here, but. Uh, All right. But as a, a colleague just said to me, ah, you've got the coveted Friday afternoon slot at four o'clock. his kids yeah. yeah yeah two of them and then a cousin i see or a niece. second cousin I think. is that what it is okay yeah just trying to figure out maybe it's a niece i'm sorry i, yeah, I don't know i don't know, I don't know. so who, who of you guys wants to go first uh, so, uh, so in a small it's gonna go yeah we're gonna go this way Is the uh, is the, the webcast is then downloadable later, right? Mm -hmm. okay. It'll be archived in a few days, and it'll be up. Okay. And also, if you go to um, Wilson Center on Demand, you can Wilson Center on Demand. Mm, it's it's on. If you go to the front page of the website, there's a link there, and okay. all of our video is there. Okay. So. Okay, <clears throat> I expect the masses are just storming up the stairways, uh, but we'll get started um, on this uh, Friday afternoon. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the European program and the History and Public Policy program here at the Wilson Center, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to our uh, session here. Um, uh, hand, me, hand me your book let me hold it up um, a book discussion of uh, a new book on solidarity with solidarity Western European trade unions and the Polish crisis 1980 to 1982 uh, edited by Iris Baltko um, and uh, we're delighted to have um, him and uh, two distinguished commentators uh, uh, here today to um, launch uh, the book. Um, Cold War Project um, that's run out of the History and Public Policy program here has uh, for many years now um, led some of the research on the Polish martial law crisis. We did some of the, together with our friends at the National Security Archive, some of the early um, uh, research conferences um, on the subject as um, the files on um, on the solidarity um, on solidarity and uh, uh, the martial law crisis and um, uh, the latter phase of the Cold War were becoming available um, and so it's a great pleasure to um, uh, discuss this book here today um, uh, the editor and author um, is Bald Gaderis. He's an assistant professor at uh, the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, where he teaches courses on East European and Imperial history. He'll start us off today. Um, his main fields of interest include uh, Polish exiles, East-West contact, and Solidarność, the Solidarność movement. Has recently published articles in a number of uh, well-known uh, journals, including Journal of Cold War Studies, and uh, he has a PhD and a 
couple of masters in history and Slavic studies. Uh, he'll be followed by Greg Domber, who is now an assistant professor of history at the University of North Florida. He used to be uh, and started out his career as uh, uh, my research assistant back at the National Security Archive and he had the Cold War project um, many winters ago. His research now focuses on American and European mechanisms for affecting democratic change under authoritarian regimes. Um, uh, obviously a, 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 a subject with salience for um, uh, uh, contemporary events. Uh, he was a Hewlett Fellow at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University, um, where he continued his research on international influences on Poland's transformation in the 1980s. Uh, he received his uh, AB from Lafayette College and holds a PhD in history from George Washington University, and his dissertation Supporting the Revolution, America, Democracy, and the End of the Cold War in Poland, 1981 to 1989, was awarded the Betty Underberger Prize of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations. Finally, then, we're joined by um, Piotr Kozitsky, who is a Centennial Fellow at ABD in the Department of History at Princeton University, a lecturer at the Institut d'Etudes Politiques in de Paris. Uh, Kuzitsky has published academic articles and book chapters in five languages, and he's currently finishing a dissertation entitled Catholic, Socialist, and European, the Transnational Story of Lay Activism in Europe, 1905 to 1980. He's also a co-editor of a forthcoming volume on the global 1989 international and transnational connections in a revolutionary world. So welcome to all three of you. We'll start off with Iris Bald and uh, hopefully very soon have uh, get to a point where we can involve all of you through some comments and questions. Um, so Iris Bald. Many thanks, Christian, for uh, this introduction and, and uh, more generally for organizing this. Also many thanks, Piotr and Greg, for being here and for commenting on my book although I still have to listen to your comments, but <laughs> I already want to express my gratitude. Okay, I don't think that I need to introduce you to the Polish crisis of the early 1980s, but just um, some um, facts. It's the, so the summer of 1980, strikes broke out in um, the Baltic seaports. Um, 31st of August 1980, the Gdańsk agreements were signed. Um, one of these 21 points was the right to establish free trade unions. In September 1980, Solidarity, Solidarność, was um, established following uh, these Gdansk agreements. Then we have 500 days of chaos, according to some, of liberty, according to others, until um, on December 13, 1981, uh, General Wojciech Jaruzelski proclaimed martial law uh, banned solidarity, um, imprisoned um, thousands, a couple of thousands of its um, 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 militants, and, um, well, just put the clock back um, um, as uh, th things had, ha uh, had been before. Uh, this is the Polish crisis. This Polish crisis caused um, a lot of social concern, social reaction in Western Europe and other parts of the world. And um, this is what this book is about, about um, the social reaction in Western Europe on the Polish crisis. I mainly focus on um, trade unions, since trade unions were at the forefront of the social reaction, Solidarność being a trade union itself. Um, reaction deferred, maybe that's also um, um, important to start with, um, especially the countries that had been um, very active were so far uh, mainly studied. And then I think of France. France was a country where a lot of solidarity um, occurred, where many people went onto the streets, where um, one of the biggest demonstrations after the Second World War happened precisely on December 14th, 1981. So France was a country that afterwards had been um, studied a lot. Other countries um, and were 
more reluctant or at least mm. perceived as more reluctant. Germany, for instance, um, has always been represented as a country that was not that solidary with um, solidarity, um, that was much more passive. Although um, during in the last five years, German historians have um, put this into perspectives and have highlighted other um, um, ways of relief and aid to solidarity and have stated that German aid to solidarity, to Solidarność, was actually uh, bigger um, than the one in France. Um, this is just, so France and Germany are just um, two examples of countries. What I do in the book, it's an edited volume. Um, so this, uh, an edited volume with chapters on particular countries. So in the book, you find chapters on France and Germany, but also on other Western European countries, such as Spain, Great Britain, Sweden, Denmark, Italy, Belgium, um, the United Kingdom, well, Great Britain, um, and so on. There's also a chapter on the international trade unions, um, the WCL and the ICFTU, who um, were also uh, concerned, of course, about solidarity. Um, what I don't want to do, neither today nor in the book, is to compare the amount of uh, or the extent of aid, just because it's almost impossible to do so, and also because it doesn't make much sense. Um, it doesn't make much sense um, for a variety of reasons. Um, first, the character of aid was different. I gave already the examples of France and Germany. In France, this was a vocal aid with demonstrations, a political aid. Um, so people, French, um, had contacts with, with um, the Polish underground, while in Germany, this had a completely different character. This was um, first more discreet and second also more humanitarian. So they um, avoided being associated with uh, politics. Other reasons um, why I don't want to compare this is that um, aid could develop over time, um, or the, the, the attitude to solidarity could develop over time. The TUC, the British Trade Union, is a good example, um, both in the summer of 1980 and in December 1981, so after the proclamation of martial law, they reacted rather reluctant to um, the events in Poland. But after a couple of weeks, this changed, and then they were ver very positive about it. So there was a development over time. Another reason not to compare is that um, the stance to solidarity within one particular Western, U Western European trade union could differ. So the, the official standpoint, for instance, of this French Communist Trade Union, CGT, was after December 1981 was negative, but this doesn't mean that all of the trade unionists, all of the members of the CGT, were negative about solidarity. Um, also, the point of reference could differ. For instance, the, Dan the Danish trade union, LO, was compared to other tra Western European trade unions, pretty silent, um, pretty neutral towards solidarity. But from a Danish point of view, um, the Danish solidarity with Solidarność was a milestone because um, the Danish trade union clashed with its political ally, the Social Democratic Party, and this, was for the f this happened for the very first time due to solidarity. So from a Danish point of view, this was um, very important. From a more Western European point of view, this is um, the Danish. The Danish were um, not that active. Um, so a variety of reasons why I don't want to compare the extent and the amount of aid. What I did do, though, was um, to um, explore the reasons why particular trade unions supported solidarity more vocally or uh, more enthusiastically or more actively than others. So the reasons why solidarity was um, solidarity with Solidarność um, was expressed. And this is also what I would like to um, give an overview of um, today. 
a first reason could be ideology. Hmm? So that's, I think, pretty obvious that those trade unions that um, have share an ideology similar to the one of Solidarność were more solidary with Solidarność than other ones. Um, and then I mainly think of the Christian Democratic trade unions. Solidarność was a mass movement, was a trade union, but was very explicitly associated with the church. It was also, um, well, this was also the ideology of Christian democratic trade unions in the West. So you might think that Christian democratic trade unions were more solidary with Solidarność. And in some countries, this was indeed the case. For instance, in Belgium, the Christian democratic trade unions um, were at the forefront, were the most explicit, the most vocal supporters of Solidarność. Um, the same in Italy, but what's interesting is that the reading of solidarity between both the Belgian and the Italian tra Christian trade unions was different. In um, Belgium, solidarity was associated with the church, while in Italy, more well, other things were emphasized, such, such as human dignity. And this was in, because in Italy, the Christian trade union collaborated, as we will see in a minute, with other trade unions. They established a common front. So the reading was different. And even more important is that in still other countries, Christian trade unions were not um, at the forefront, were not the most vocal supporters of solidarity. And I mainly think here of Spain, where the, um, the most solidary trade union was the Uso, um, a, a former underground trade union under the Franco regime, who associated solidarity with its own past in the underground. So that was the main reason, not the Christian democratic ideology. Um, What's also important is that not only Christian or Christian democratic trade unions, but also other trade unions could support Solidarność. Also social democratic trade unions. So not only the Christian, but also the social democratic or some social democratic trade unions supported Solidarność. While you could ex have expected the opposite, social democratic trade unions had a past, a recent past of collaboration with the Eastern Bloc during the detente of the 1970s. But in some countries, social democratic uh, trade unions supported solidarity to the, almost the same extent as Christian democratic trade unions did. For instance, in Italy, where solidarity was especially associated with COR, with the Committee of uh, the Defense of the Workers, hmm? another example is the Swedish social democratic trade union, that bracketed, that actually did the opposite of this Italian one. It did not associate Solidarność with a political party, with the Cor, but avoided um, this, um, this political involvement and emphasized the trade union character of Solidarity, just because um, it didn't want to um, to get into domestic politics, of, of into Polish po uh, domestic politics. So some social democratic trade unions <coughs> supported solidarity, other ones did not. Um, in Belgium, for instance, the social democratic trade union um, did not put Solidarność too high on the agenda and actually was much more active in other um, global issues such as Latin America, South Africa, anti-apartheid and so on. Um, so here too, Ideology cannot account for um, the solidarity. A third point, so next uh, we had the Christian democratic ones, we had the social democratic ones. Also interesting is that the most vocal uh, supporter of solidarity was the CFDT in France, which was neither Christian nor social democratic, but had another profile, another different path, and I won't get into, the deta into details, but um, was a trade union 
that highlighted even different things of solidarity, such as the autogestion, the self-government of trade unions, or the resyndicalisation, the reunification, re so the um, re-trade re unionism. Um, or the deuxième gauche, the second left. So they read, they interpreted solidarity from their um, point of view. Fourth point, of, fourth element, why I wouldn't use ideology as the main explanation for solidarity with Solidarność is the fact that communist trade unions in some countries also supported solidarity. Not in all of the countries. In France, the CGT, the communist trade union, was solidary with Solidarność uh, and before December 1981, but then um, supported Jaruzelski's um, martial law. Um, the same in Spain. In other countries, though, in Italy and in Belgium, the communist trade unions also supported uh, Solidarność after martial law. Um, this was due to the um, tradition of Eurocommunism and then for Italy um, also due to um, the importance, um, the Italian, com the Communist Trade Union of Italy um, uh, paid to um, the common front of trade unions. Okay, that's about ideology. Ideology, uh, to my, um, in my view, doesn't account for, or is not the main explanation um, for um, solidarity with Solidarność. I give other um, um, explanations um, or other hypotheses, but um, I think rather than now exploring the things that aren't important in my eyes, I think it's better now to go to um, what matters. And I think that my thesis, my main thesis in the book is that the solidarity was colored mainly by domestic issues, was interpreted by um, issues in particular Western European countries. Um, in Spain, for instance, um, there was solidarity with Solidarność, but this was read by um, the particular Spanish context, which first um, was not very oriented towards Poland. Spain was much more oriented to Latin America than to Eastern Europe. And this changed only after um, the coup of February 1981 and the coup of this in Spain, the, um, the, the, the coup the, that was not um, uh, successful, and the coup in December 1981 in Poland. So they had then the common experience of a coup. Hmm? But still afterwards, Spain was, many Spaniards were suspicious of Solidarność, of dissidents in Eastern Europe. For instance, also, um, because these were associated with the Franco regime. Even in 1976, so the year Franco died, um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn had paid a visit to Spain and had praised Franco. And this was what many Spaniards remembered of, or, um, of dissidents and associated Solidarność with. What about France? Well, France um, also had an experience with Solzhenitsyn, but this was different. In France, um, in the 1950s and 60s, many intellectuals had been left-oriented, left-wing oriented. Um, but after the spring of Prague, 1968, and the publication of Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn's Archipel, um, Gulag Archipelago, um, they renounced this sympathy for, uh, com or many intellectuals renounced this sympathy for communism, sympathy with communism. And in this process of decommunization, Solidarność was a catharsis. Um, and this accounts for the massive solidarity with Solidarność in France. Um, also because not only trade unions, but also intellectuals and artists um, shared this solidarity with Solidarność. 
What about Germany? But Germany had its own domestic um, context of um, relationship with Poland. Um, and that's mainly the, the common world, Second World War past. Um, the relationship between Germany and, and I'm talking of course of Western Germany, and Poland was difficult due to the Second World War, due to um, several issues that hadn't been solved yet. Uh, think of the borders, think of the German minority in, um, in Poland. And um, this mattered in the German reading of Solidarność. Um, the Germans were afraid that Solidarność might um, jeopardize the chance of a unification of Germany. Um, the Germans were also used by the Polish communists um, as a proof that solidarity was supported by foreigners, by fascis fascists, by Germans. Um, so in, in, in order to avoid this, this association, Germans were much more reluctant, much more discreet and much more generous because of this Second World War past. So, but this was, the, the support, the solidarity was completely different um, from the, um, the one in France. Another country, which is also very interesting, is Austria. Austria was perhaps the most anti-Solidarność, um, was surprisingly um, reluctant, um, Bruno Kreisky, the, the Austrian Chancellor, even called Vawenza, Lech Vawenza, criminal. Um, and this was mainly because of, again, the domestic context. In Austria, uh, Austria was very dependent on um, uh, coal, on Polish coal. And so in 1981, um, the Austrian Chancellor called the um, Polish strikers, the Polish miners, to go back to the coal mines in order to provide um, the country, Austria, with coal. Um, this was early 1981. From the summer of 1981 onwards, um, the Austrian reading of the Polish crisis was colored by the refugee question. Um, Austria was flooded by Polish refugees, it was the closest country uh, to, to Poland, and, um, and these refugees were perceived by um, many Austrian trade unionists as a threat to the local labor market. So this was a reason to be more reluctant to um, the Polish crisis than many other countries. The same, ref I mean, the, ref the question of refugees also occurred in Germany. There were many more refugees, Polish refugees, in Germany and in Austria than in France. Um, numbers are difficult to, to give because um, um, these refugees uh, moved ac uh, across countries. But um, according to some estimates, there were 150,000 refugees in Germany and only 6,000 in France. So this also explains the bigger enthusiasm in France, um, they, weren't, they, didn't, they didn't face this um, uh, question of, of immigrants. Um, okay, um, there are many more things I, I could say, um, but I'll leave it at, at here. So for my interpretation, um, my main point is that this solidarity with Solidarność differed and that this was colored um, by domestic issues, that every European country reacted to the Polish crisis in its own way and that this was um, interpreted with, from their own um, experiences. Now, why does this matter? Um, well, I put this, this, this whole research in the context of the research on trans, tra, uh, the transnationality of social movements. Um, and if we have a look at, um, at this research, 
then this is mainly um, determined by uh, the research on anti-apartheid. And the anti-apartheid is represented by most authors as a very transnational movement, as if the whole world, Western Europe as well as other parts of the world, collaborated together in the struggle against apartheid. That they were used the same strategies, the same um, program, that they had contacts with each other, and that in this way they were pre predece prede predecessors of um, today's global social movements, such as the anti-globalists, climate movement, and so onwards. I haven't done research on anti-apartheid, but what I see um, with the solidarity movement is that this was completely different. There wasn't that transnational social movement. Um, of course, there were contacts, there were international contacts, but they were bilateral. They were bilateral between one particular Western European country and Poland. But there weren't any contacts between, let's say, France and Germany in collaboration with Poland. So this transnationality that is often referred to um, in concerning other um, social movements does not occur with solidarity. Why? Well, I think that this is mainly due to the fact that Poland was much closer um, to Western Europe than South Africa was. Um, and that result, as a result, um, well, particular individual countries reacted in different ways. Um, we see the same with the peace movement. Um, regarding the peace movement, which is also an, an international or transnational social movement, we also, all, in spite of the fact that they were puzzled or they faced the same um, problems, we see that uh, the peace movements were also had some very national character, characteristics, very national features. Um, so I think that East-West movements were in the 1980s much more bilateral or much more nationally colored than North-South movements. But this is, this is of course a hypothesis that is um, to be discussed um, um, and that is to be researched and analyzed more thoroughly on archival research. Um, maybe it's better now to stick with uh, solidarity. Um, and I'm looking forward to the comments of um, Greg and Piotr. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Iris Bald. We'll go to Greg now, who I think I forgot to mention, as I should have, that you are also, and my colleague Nida Galazis, who stepped in, Remind me of the, uh, that by her sheer presence. I think you are also an alumni of the Wilson Center. Didn't you get one of the East European? Oh yeah, that's right. I, I was. Short term scholar grants. Yeah, so yeah, short term uh, scholar. Uh, right. you, you were you started your career here as an okay. intern, but uh, yeah. there were steps in between. Anyways, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you, Isabel, for for the book, but also for bringing us together today. Um, it's reminded me in the twenty minutes we talked before this which we got very much off the book itself and began talking about other topics, how fruitful this collaboration has been in that in the last 20 minutes I had a better conversation about Poland than I've had in six months at my home university. So could, it's could really you just quite, speak to the microphone since we're webcasting this? Okay. It's really quite useful. Um, it's also special for me to be here, as Christian explained, um, because I used to sit on the other end of the, of the table quite a bit. Um, and I did learn a lot from copying all of all of those books for you and uh, transcribing all those documents. So I knew it. It worked out. Um, my comments today are from the perspective of an Americanist. I study U.S.-Polish relations um, in an international context, certainly, but I focus primarily on American policies and, and American positions, um, not only of, of uh, the labor movement, but also um, the American government, um, other non-governmental organizations, humanitarian groups in particular, um, through a lens of Polish records and Polish documents from both the opposition and from the Polish government. This for me is an exceedingly, exceedingly useful volume because in 
in the American records, you see reference to all of these other groups and what they're doing. But this is the first collection I've had that provides the context to actually make sense of the complete jumble of information that, that is in the archives. Um, and as American records from the 1980s become more and more available at, right now at the, the Reagan Library, certainly they're becoming more available, but also um, Carter Library and I think the National Archives is now getting into the early 80s in releases. This, this volume provides amazing context to understand the conversations that Americans are then having about these groups. Um, that's sort of the subtext of, of the conversations. And is, I've been waiting for this volume and to read it because it's always been confounding. To, to understand the national context of each of these places. And this volume does an amazing job at that. So I think it's, it's, um, it's really essential reading for certainly anybody looking at the Solidarity Movement, but more generally it speaks to um, the domestic political conversations in the early 80s, which show up in, in numerous other ways um, in, in broader concerns, whether the, the transnational movements you're talking about or just east-west relations. Um, in the book, you, you, in the introduction, you cite uh, the Helene Sigerson book quite a bit. And I, this, as a companion to that, brings a lot more depth and a lot more nuance to what she was talking about. Um, I think works quite well. The second comment I wanted to make is that um, I think holding this at the Cold War Project is a, is a perfect place because it's the kind of collaborative effort that, that you've been pushing for the last 15 years, 12 years. Um, bringing together the group of scholars you brought together, they did the work that would have taken a single person 10 years. I mean, it probably feels like 10 years to you where's the work, but um, it is the depth of, of research into the, the local labor archives is, is really impressive. Um, and it's, it's a thoroughly useful um, volume for that reason as well. I agree completely with, with it is bald, that, that one of the great things about this book is that it shows the importance of the domestic contexts of these international events. Um, in the international history community in the United States, uh, particularly I'm thinking here of, the, of Schaefer, Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, and sort of the H. Diplo crowd, we're always unsure of how to define transnational or international history. And this volume makes an, an excellent case for the importance of nation. And, and nationhood in, in terms of the context within which um, they see the events somewhere else and very much coloring it. There's a great line in, in, the, um, in the essay about Spain that uh, Spain, uh, they viewed solidarity through Spanish eyes. And that could be said about all these cases. Um, I think that's really uh, an important lesson that um, this isn't a transnational story. It really is individualized to each country in each case. Uh, and I think it works against some people trying to push transnationalism where it doesn't exist. Um, I do think there's a transnational story here. Um, the humanitarian effort, I think, is much more transnational. Um, and one thing I do wish, my, my only criticism of the volume would be that I wish you'd sort of fleshed out the role of the Polish diaspora a bit more. Um, Poles emigre polls show up in each of these chapters at some level. Uh, and there's an amazing chapter on, on ICFTU and WCL, uh, the international trade unions. And I think to have a chapter or, or some deeper reference, maybe in the, the 10th anniversary version, um, to seeing the diaspora. And I think there were connections between Poles in Belgium and, and France, certainly. And that is a very different way of looking at it, but I think it would be very useful to look for more of the transnational aspects of this. Uh, that was one thing that, that I was struck by. Um, to get um, back to the domestic issue, I wanted to talk a little bit about the American domestic context uh, and the reaction by American uh, labor unions to this. Like other places, Poland had been a point of interest to some uh, since about 1976. Um, there had been groups uh, particularly I'm thinking of the uh, League for Industrial Democracy that had been looking at Poland for quite some time and, and were certainly active in East European circles, but it's not until August 1980 that American labor takes any sort of national stance on this. 
Uh, and like many of these places, it's, it's quite early on in, while the Gdansk Accords are being um, negotiated. August 20th, uh, the AFLC Executive Council comes out, makes a statement saying, uh, supporting the workers and calling for, that, calling for repressive measures not to be used to say the state should not react with violence. Um, shortly after the United Accords are signed, um, Lane Kirkland comes out and declares, announces the creation of the Polish Workers Aid Fund uh, and, and gives an initial donation of $25,000 uh, from the AFL-CIO to support what's going on. Um, in the American case, most of our information, most of the American information, comes through the ICFTU. And their first contacts, direct contacts, are through Charles Kassman who is, uh, makes a trip in September of 1980. Um, it's interesting because there's a real concern within Solidarność to be too connected to the United States and that there could be a backlash, particularly if it's direct money being sent to the trade union. This comes up again and again in, in, in numerous accounts of, of the Kassman visit. Um, and the Americans respect this. Most of American money goes in the form of basically um, uh, typewriters, paper, printing presses, and faxes. Faxes are an important part, actually. A, 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 an early technology that is useful after the de declaration of martial law to get information back out. Um, and I think the Americans are quite happy about uh, their, their use of, of faxes uh, and, and getting them to, to solidarity. Uh, ultimately, the Polish Workers Aid Fund is about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, most of it is funneled, the first half of that is funneled before December 1981, uh, and it goes through primarily the ICFTU um, to give a sense of, of the numbers here. Um, although I agree completely with Itisbald that trying to account for them cleanly is impossible. Uh, unions are not good at accounting for money, and you see multiple unions claiming responsibility for the same offset print, printing press uh, that they're clearly all contributing to. So it gets, it gets quite messy. Um, in terms of ideology and motivation, in the American domestic context, and particularly with Kirkland, uh, it is about anti-communism. Uh, that, is, that is the tenor of the conversation uh, throughout the AFL-CIO at the national level. There are certainly others who are concerned primarily with just sort of traditional international union solidarity, and that's what drives them, that they would support any, any independent trade union. Um, but for Kirkland and Tom Kahn and uh, Tom Donahue, the heads of the AFL-CIO at this point, it's really about um, anti-communism. And this is where it, the domestic context becomes very interesting um, and fits very much with, with what you've argued about Western Europe. There are fights between the AFL, or not fights, there, there are disagreements between the AFL-CIO and both the Carter and Reagan administrations. Both the Carter and Reagan administrations see the AFL-CIO going too far uh, and pushing too hard. And Carter and Reagan are both trying to balance this uh, a line between um, supporting the PZPR for making changes uh, and keeping the Soviets out. And the fear is that if there's too much of a direct American connection or international connection, that'll bring the Soviets in. There's actually a fascinating meeting December 15th, 1981, two days after martial law, where Department of State officials meet with Donahue and, and ask explicitly, are the Soviets or are the, the Polish militia, are they going to find anything in solidarity records that will look bad? Um, and Donahue responds, no, because they had acted within the wishes of Lech Wałęsa and others in, in for just the materials they had asked for. After martial law, it becomes very interestingly um, a contest between the Reagan administration and the AFL-CIO in terms of who can be more anti-communist. Um, unlike the conversations in, say, West Germany, where Reagan's sanctions are seen as very provocative, in the American context, the response by the AFL-CIO is that Reagan is not doing enough, that he should declare a grain embargo again against the Soviet Union, what he, he listed, uh, had lifted about a year, well, less than a year earlier. Um, and calling for the United States to um, basically call back all of Poland's debt, to force Poland into bankruptcy. Um, Reagan for, and his administration, for their part, are actually more moderate than they get a lot of credit for, I think, in this period. And I've got another article on that. 
um, that they don't force Poland into bankruptcy. Uh, they actually pay American banks with <laughs> taxpayer money for money that Poland had owed uh, for at least six months into 1982, I think a bit longer. We can talk about why they do that. Um, but the myth of the hardline Reagan, or the non-pragmatic Reagan, I think is, is, is blown apart by the, the response to solidarity. Um, but again, this, this broader conversation about the domestic context, that contention between the AFL-CIO and the Reagan administration explains why the AFL-CIO does what it does. Uh, it has less to do with what's actually happening in Poland and more how they're seeing it through the domestic lens, um, which is pretty fascinating. Finally, um, and this, this segues into what uh, Pilcher's going to talk about, I, I hope, um, is that there are one thing that's become clear to me studying solidarity is that it is has a multiplicity of meanings. Solidarity is not a cohesive Solidarność is not a cohesive group. They um, it comes from multiple places. It leads in multiple directions. Uh, it is a trade union. It's a nationalist movement. It's a Catholic movement. Uh, once you mix in um, student solidarity and rural solidarity, it gets even more confusing. Um, it is an opposition group in that it is an opposition to the to communism and, and to the PCPR, but beyond that, um, it never fully defines itself, which is one of its great benefits. Um, and that's why you can have Lane Kirkland um, focusing on, on anti-communism um, and communist unions in Italy also supporting solidarity for their own reasons. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll leave it to filter to clean up. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank also Edith Bald for organizing the panel and uh, Christian Ostermann and the Wilson Center for kindly hosting. Um, I have to say that I really found this to be maybe the best edited volume I've read ever, at, <laughs> certainly in a very long time. It's rare. I, I, I know that you know, we're, we're here stumping for the book, obviously. <laughs> so the, you need the, the requisite bit of praise to come at the beginning. But it's very rare to find a volume that comes out of a conference that is so deeply uh, focused on interactions with primary documents. Uh, now, granted, this isn't strictly speaking a conference volume. There's a very clear analytical design to it, which Edith Bald and Greg have both discussed at some length so far. But uh, what you will find if you pick up the book is that each successive chapter starts out with a, a paragraph to the effect of there is very little secondary literature on this matter. Uh, therefore, we are going to explore the following archives. And there's an effort made to cover archives representing every single country that is included in the volume, usually in reference to Polish archives and uh, to oral history as well. And I mean, this just independently of the sort of analytical points that I'd like to make, I'd like to underscore that because it really is a remarkable feat for an, an edited volume. So. Praise for the book. Uh, now, in somewhat uh, something, I would say in contradistinction to uh, the, the tenor of Edith Bald and Greg's comments about bilateralism and international history, I mean, I want to say that uh, you may, sound, may have sounded a bit odd to you when Christian Osterman read the title of my dissertation to you, Why Am I on This Panel? Because this is a book about uh, essentially labor solidarity and I work on Catholic activism. Uh, it's true that labor solidarity plays some role in my research, particularly with respect to Christian labor unions. And if you look at the book, you'll find that Christian labor unions are tremendously significant to the story. Uh, Edith Bald's points about the affinity between Christian democracy and solidarity make for a very, very interesting uh, point of discussion. Uh, because there's there, there, there's a lot conceptually behind that. But what I wanted to underscore is the fact that there are, in addition to sort of the obvious schematic that the book is set up to examine specifically the domestic contingencies and conditioning of bilateral relationships between a given country in Western Europe and 
Poland, there are also there is a lot of room for transnational analysis within the framework that the authors set up. And in particular, the one chapter in the book that's devoted to two international trade unions is sort of uh, an obvious example <laughs> of effective transnational analysis of support for solidarity. And I, I'd like to move slowly back toward uh, Greg's concluding point as I, uh, I, I sort of will conclude my brief remarks. But just very briefly, I think it's worth considering that there may be three general axes uh, along which transnational analysis, you know, we, there's certainly a discussion to be had, a long discussion along the lines of what Greg mentioned, what exactly do international and transnational history mean in the larger scheme of things? Well, if you take this one chapter on two trade unions, confederations of trade unions that transcend national boundaries, the uh, International Confederation of Free Trade Unions and the World Confederation of Labor, two very distinct trade unions coming from dis distinct ideological profiles and different alignments in general when it comes to Cold War politics, both move towards supporting solidarity ultimately. And the story of their move is transnational. These are, depending on how you look at them, either composite networks of different institutions located and fixed within specific domestic contexts, linked across national boundaries, or single organizations that exist above the national realm. I, I'd like to sort of mention a couple of other points that I think are worth considering for those of you wanting to reflect sort of beyond uh, what you read in the book, uh, one being the diaspora point that Greg made, which is that clearly Poles present in each of the countries in question in the book, considered in the book, are linked in some fashion. Sometimes these links are explicit, sometimes they're implicit. Some, it depends, of course, on the type of em emigration. If we're talking simply about uh, migration, it's a different story than if we're talking about political emigres who are actively moving around Western Europe or more broadly the Western world, agitating on behalf of, and written, in most instances, raising money for efforts to fight, or anti-communist efforts more generally. So the diaspora is, uh, I, I agree completely, the 10th anniversary volume has to include a text on the diaspora. Second is this issue of networks versus single transnational institutions. And here I think one text that also uh, would benefit tremendously, although there would, be have to, there would have to be a very, very specific angling, is the church or the, the papacy to a certain extent. Now, we don't have access to the documents that we would need to write the story, the, the definitive account. There have been some, some anecdotal and some, I mean, not that they're, they're, they're not worth reading, but the, definitive, the, the documentation is missing. If we want a, a, a substantive an engagement of the Vatican's relationship to solidarity and promotion of solidarity, equivalent to what we get for these specific stories that are already in the book. That said, there is a significant Catholic element that emerges across virtually all of the chapters in this book, accepting, you know, even, even for those countries that are distinctly non-Catholic, so Denmark, Sweden, for example, there is a sense of the importance of Catholicism to solidarity that makes it a real question for the trade unions and for national groups whether or not to support Poles. In other words, there are those with the Christian affinity who think to themselves solidarity is Christian inclined, Christian inspired, of course we're going to support it. And there are those who say, oh my goodness, these are Catholic nationalists. Why on earth should we be supporting them? And the, that spectrum of analysis, that, that spectrum of opinion, comes, I think, significantly into play. Now, there are a couple different ways, I think, that one could approach uh, a, a systematic analysis, even sort of abstracting away from what did John Paul II do, which is an extraordinarily important question to telling the whole story here. And I think that a couple, one approach is to begin with some of the internal differentiation that we find across the national cases. And here I go, I, I will pick up where, where Greg left off in his point that there are multiple solidarities. Now, something that bears a lot more discussion than I can uh, give here, but just as a brief, brief introduction to the matter, 
uh, worth saying is that solidarity is not just a unified anti-communist front. Uh, it, for the most part, this may be a, a somewhat controversial, sort of in the, according to the standard interpretation, but, but solidarity in some ways is a very unique combination of Catholicism and socialism. This is where sort of I feel like I come into the picture and having a couple of words to say on the book because in many of these chapters you observe, uh, the authors in the book observe extremely uh, convincingly on behalf, uh, on the basis of the documentary evidence that there is a, a certain, uh, let's say, um, each act, there's something for everyone in solidarity. The socialists in Western Europe, if you're a Cornelius Castoriadis, if you're, uh, you know, uh, if you're, uh, well, maybe, maybe, maybe communism would be going too far here, uh, but uh, Alain Turin, uh, you like the uh, Jacek Kuroins and the Adam Michniks, so the Committee for the Defense of Workers' Orientation. If you are a member of the uh, CFDT, granted not Christian Democratic anymore, but a distinctly Christian origin trade union in France, or the World Confederation of Labor, also formerly Christian labor union, or the still Christian Italian labor union in the early 1980s, you would there's a good chance that if you were in the leadership of those unions, you would have had direct face-to-face -face contact with Tadeusz Mazowiecki, and this comes up in several of the chapters, that Mazowiecki, Andrzej Wielowiecki, there are a number of significant players in the Solidarity leadership, and particularly among the advisors, who are members of the Catholic Intelligentsia Clubs. And just by way of suggesting this fact, the contact between left-leaning Catholics in Poland and left-leaning Catholics in various countries of Western Europe goes back decades, goes back into the 1950s, if not earlier. And this is an important part of the story, because when we talk about Jan Kuakowski, the emigre leader of, by, by this time, the Secretary General of the World Confederation of Labor, uh, who can, sort of shapes the policy of the Confederation with respect to solidarity with solidarity, he had met Mazowiecki for the first time in 1963. He had introduced Mazowiecki to all the, the major players in the leadership of that Confederation of Labor in Brussels in the early 1960s. Some of these are at the level of personal context, and we can ask, how exactly do we extrapolate or generalize on the basis of that? But if we dial 20 years later and look at the writings and conversations that were going on among the solidarity leadership, there is a sense of this negotiation. On the one hand, Catholic social teaching, some directly linked to papal documentation, some to this sort of left-leaning, personalist sense uh, in which uh, Pope John Paul II also received his intellectual training. And on the other hand, this notion of non-communist or anti-communist socialism, not the ter exact terminology used. There were a ver variety of, of conceptions that came out, but uh, small-scale, localized socialism. So the fact, the multiplicity of solidarity sort of inclines us toward remembering that the contacts are quite deep when it comes to personal networks, institutional networks, and that those play into the later contacts, not just at the trade union level, but more broadly, if we want to start talking about intellectuals, peace movements, any number of other types of groups. I've gone on for too long, but at any rate, thank you once again for the invitation. I strongly encourage you all to pick up the book. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, three just wonderful presentations here, really stimulating. Um, the, we have a little bit time uh, left for, for discussion, so let's take a few comments and questions. Um, if you could please, in Wilson Center tradition, and since we're webcasting this live, for our viewers out there, identify yourself by name and affiliation if you like. So, yeah, the gentleman back there. <clears throat> I'm Mark Gruenberg um, with Press Associates News Service. I'm also a native Chicagoan. I'll 
that make that I make that point specifically to back up the gentleman who talked about the Catholic diaspora. <laughs> uh, Chicago has often been called the second largest Polish city in the world. <laughs> so then, believe me, the Catholic diaspora on the northwest side was very strongly supportive, and I'd like you to talk more about that. A factual question for the author, and uh, and then an interpretive question. Uh, you mentioned that the that there are approximately 6,000 Polish uh, refugees in France, and of course France, were, the French unions and and France in general was very very openly supportive of Solidarność, whereas there were 150,000 in um, in uh, Germany, and Germany had to be more humanitarian and low key. And at the same time, you mentioned that Austria was hostile, and Austria had the mo had the most, but you didn't say what the number was. That's question one. Question two is how much, especially in the European context, how much linkage was there between a particular union, say the CGT, and its accompanying political party? You mentioned that there were cases of splits, but is that in general, or was that, was that the exception? All right. Ismail, do you want to go first? And could you repeat your second question? Because I, I looked up, I found already the, the answer to the first. The, the second question, when you mentioned that in some cases there were splits between the um, trade union and its sponsoring political party, you, me you mentioned one or two of them, but I wanted to find out, is that, was that more the exception or the rule? Where okay. Go ahead. Um, yeah, maybe first, also thanks to the, the comments of um, Greg and Piotr. Actually, they, they gave a similar criticism, which is also related to your question, and that's the, the lack of Polish diaspora, which I completely agree with. Poles were key in this story, also the Western European exiles. And I uh, touched upon the refugees, but of course exiles the more elite, the more active um, polls were, were important as well. Actually, I, I got into the subject um, by working on the Coordinating Office of Solidarity, by, uh, led by Jerzy Milewski in, in Brussels and so on. And so while reading his reports to the Polish underground in the archives of the, the um, Polish Secret Services in, in, at IPN, IPN um, I read that, well, his his comments and his 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 interpretation of of um, the differences between the Western European countries, and so what I did subsequently subsequently, um, well, I asked um, labor historians in all of these countries to elaborate on this, and the result was more a labor history than a Polish history. Um, many of these authors do not speak Polish but they speak Danish and Italian and Spanish and all of these languages we don't speak. Um, so th there's always, yeah. Having said this, I think that Polish exiles occur in the book and they also um, endorse my main arguments. Um, first, there was this bilateralism. Also, there was this competition. Uh, competition between Western European trade unions of hosting key Polish leaders, of inviting Wałęsa and so on. and. More importantly, they didn't cover each other's uh, each other's activities. So when Wawensa was in, well, maybe Wawensa is an exception, but when Bogdan Lis was in one country, this wasn't um, um, covered in 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 other uh, trade union in other countries' trade union press. Now um, about the Austrians, I had a quick look and. Um, on exact numbers, I quote uh, from the book, exact numbers for December 1981 have not been found, but on January 1st, 1982, 27,492 asylum seekers from the communist bloc were living in camps, among them 23,419 Poles. This is January the 1st, 1982. This gives an impression of accuracy, but I must emphasize that this is um, just a shot of the day and, and, and you should compare this within um, um, other contexts. Austria was a smaller country than Germany was. I even um, doubt about um, this number of 6,000 refugees in France. Many of them passed were on their way to um, uh, the US or Canada. They moved across countries, so it's, it's difficult um, 
to compare this, um, maybe I should also refer to uh, the newly released, bu released book by Darius Stola. Uh, who has worked on um, Polish emigration, so from the Polish People's Republic, and I think his book appeared just two weeks ago, and I'm really, I haven't seen it yet, but I'm really looking forward to reading his chapter on solidarity. About um, your second question, I wouldn't say there were splits between political parties and trade unions, but there was uh, disagreement, and most trade unions um, were um, more active um, about solidarity than uh, political parties were. Um, I can give the example of, of Sweden, uh, where Olaf Palme was also supportive of solidarity, but also called um, for less hate um, to uh, the Soviet Union, for more um, reluctance, while the Swedish LO, so the Swedish trade union, was maybe one of the most important trade unions in support of solidarity. Many of, much of the, the aid to Poland was channeled via Sweden, which was uh, through the Baltic Sea, a neighboring country of, of Poland. So there weren't splits, there was um, rather di disagreement, and I would say that this was a rule rather than um, an exception. Even in those countries where the government or the um, the leading party um, was in support of solidarity, such as um, the United Kingdom. Um, Margaret Thatcher, just like Ronald Reagan, was um, very um, active, um, but the British government, um, at a certain point, called the TUC, so the British Trade Union, to be uh, more cautious um, with its stance to, uh, towards Poland. So there, there too, there was this um, this disagreement, but I wouldn't, of, co of course, um, say that the TUC was was more solidary with with um, Solidarność than than Margaret Thatcher was. So, but there was disagreement as well there. Pietro, did you want to respond to any of the question, or I don't know if there was a question for me so much as the observation about okay. Chicago okay. and which let's I take it as an observation. <laughs> all right, all right, very good. Ludka <laughs> Kuna. So, yeah, Ludka Kuna. I'm a visiting uh, scholar here at the Wilson Center from Germany, and I, I would like to know whether you looked um, uh, up the um, any any generational uh, um, you know dimension. Uh, I say this also in light of the current events in, in the Middle East. Uh, uh, and um, maybe this is a little bit anecdotal, but just when thinking back to the events of, of 81, I think the German Chancellor Helmut Schmidt sp spent the weekend of the uh, declaration of martial law in the GDR and uh, walking through this empty, uh, weird streets there of Güstrow and then coming back and telling all of us in Germany that, well, this is a very dangerous situation. Think of w the World War II. This could end up in World War Three. We know how war was. And the day after the uh, visit of Schmidt, I attended a, um, a, a church service in Cologne Cathedral. There were easily 6,000 young people uh, just uh, rallied by the German uh, Catholic youth movement, and no matter what their political affiliations were, left or right, uh, they were all, uh, you know, it, with tears in our eyes, 6,000 or so of us, uh, in favor of, of Solidarność as a symbol of freedom for all of us. And I wonder whether this, now this is all 30 years back, but did you, did you find any generational differences there in the different countries across of, uh, Europe? Not that much, but what I would argue is that um, that um, Vietnam was a source of inspiration here, um, and that the solidarity movement, as a massive movement, um, was a f the first East-West social movement um, that was so massive, and that this this was largely inspired, I think, by 68 and by Vietnam. If we look at Budapest 1956 or even the Spring of Prague 1968, reaction in Western Europe and in other parts of the world was much um, more uh, low-key, maybe not concerning Budapest, but Budapest was very short. 
um, while this solidarity with Solidarność was massive, was um, included not only unionists, not only, well, many generations included pop songs. There's one U2 song, um, but I forgot the name, um, also the, which referred to to, um, um, to Solidarność, so just like the anti-apartheid anti movement also had this uh, Give Me Hope Joanna song. So they're, they're, I think that that. Solidarity united many generations. Yeah. Um, can I make yeah, a comment sure. on that? Um, in terms of the the political exiles that the AFL CIO then works with in the, in the 1980s after martial law, there and I haven't looked into this very much, but there's a really interesting split between those who leave during or after World War II, directly after World War II, and those that leave after '68 and then are are caught abroad by the declaration of martial law that the that the younger um the younger activists who had lived under communism there are significant breaks between those younger activists and and the ones who came out before world war ii or just after world war ii um, and that's both a source of tension um but the younger ones also tended to be um more willing to support solidarity um and had a because there were personal relationships that also pl played into these networks. Uh, I think part of it is literally having both all been in Warsaw University in 1967 helped uh, in creating these networks. Yeah. Okay. Let's take a final round of questions and then give our panelists one more chance to respond. So, we'll start with Ross here, then go to the lady in the back and end with the gentleman over there. Ross Johnson, Wilson Center. Um, the book is about West European um, trade unions. Greg's talked about AFL-CIO. Um, you know, here in the United States, the common um, the common image is um, AFL-CIO drove the whole effort. Um, so the question would be, how much did AFL-CIO um, sort of um, take a leading role? in terms of sort of direction, and then the question of um, comparative resources, resources from the United States versus uh, the respective West European countries. And the second is just the observation that you've, you, you, you've, you've, several of you have made, um, the importance of the Polish diaspora and the horizontal connections among people, not just thinking about what to do, but in terms of implementation. And people are actually taking things in uh, from different countries. We're certainly in touch with each other. All right, we're going to force you to do some comparing of numbers after all. But first, back to the, the, all the way in the back there. I had a very similar question. I worked on the Appropriations Committee on the, on the Hill during the early 80s, and the AFL-CIO would come up and really insist that they were, exclu they were funding solidarity, and without channeling money to the AFL-CIO, we really, solidarity might collapse. So I'm very interested to, to hear both Greg and the author explore this whether there was even any resentment on the side of solidarity in the Western European trade unions about the AFL-CIO, or did, were they not aware that, at least on the American side, the AFL-CIO was claiming a tremendous amount of credit for, for this? All right, could you just state your name since? Sure, Eleanor Gayatong. Okay, great. And then there was one final question right there. Chachin mm -hmm. uh, I also have a question about AFL-CIO. Then I also have that uh, about the uh, uh, international labor organization. Thank you. Okay, so um, who wants to go first? Greg. Okay. Greg? All right. um, in terms of comparative resources, I hadn't seen the num. I knew the numbers from the United States. Um, what there's there's a very interesting pattern here, and that is that I think the AFL-CIO um, in this early period, the eighty to eighty-two period, uh, and certainly into the first year of martial law is doing its part, but by no means is it, is it more significant than any of the West European labor unions. In particular, the, the coordinating office, which becomes Solidarity's main um, force in the West, and I, I'm interested if you agree with this, I think it's the, it's the 8 million francs that really, sur they survive because of the 8 million francs in that first year. It's only after the creation of the National Endowment for Democracy and congressional funds being sent through the AFL-CIO that you see hundreds of thousands of dollars going to solidarity. And it's not AFL-CIO money. 
It is congressional money. The Free Trade Union Institute, uh, I've talked to Eugenia Kemble, who was, who was part of creating NED and then became the director of Free Trade Union Institute, had no money. They, until NED money started flowing, there was, the AFL-CIO didn't do much. And I think you see a, a sort of a, a peak in union support, direct union support, um, between around martial law. And a lot of it goes to humanitarian aid. Um, after, this, after 1984, 1984 to 1989, my guesstimate and the conversations I've had with some of the, I forget who the, the um, woman we met in, in Wrocław, who was uh, one of Malewski's main secretaries and... and uh, Pilarska. Pilarska, yeah, Anna Pilarska, um, confirmed that it was about half American money going through the coordinating office at that point, between a third and a half. Uh, of their annual budget. Um, that's after 1984, to give you a sense of uh, comparisons. Okay. It's not only the Americans who claim um, to, have, uh, to have saved uh, solidarity, the French do the same. Yeah. But as you quoted, and these, these 8 million francs were key in the, indeed in, in the first years. Um, but the Germans also claim to have been uh, the most... Um, generous supporters of solidarity, and now I quote again from the book. Um, so Albrecht, which a uh, German scholar, therefore estimates that all the goods sent to Poland in the years 1981-1983 had a total value of at least 1 billion Deutschmark, which is 40, 4, 450 million US dollars, So, which outnumbers both the French and the, the American aid. Now, this aid was humanitarian, wasn't political, wasn't only for solidarity, but was for the Polish society. And um, but this is also the reason why I don't want to compare these numbers. Mm -hmm. I think that um, many people did a lot, um, that all of this uh, aid was substantial, but um, that any of the particular trade unions or countries or individuals such as Lane Kirkland or whatever can claim to to have to, to be the, the savior um, of, of Solidarność. Can I, I wanted to add one thing to that. There's a very funny coincidence in most of these in that I think nine out of 11 essays start with a quote from Lech Wałęsa saying, you were the most important country for us. <laughs> <laughs> like he is really good at being convincing about, you know, when he's in front of the American Congress, it's the United States. When he's talking to a Danish labor union, it was, you know, it was Denmark that yeah. did it. And, and so it's, it's very, and I think it's, I think it's sincere at a level too. It's, it's, you know, there was this sense of we're only surviving because of the help from the outside. Yeah. Um, There's even competition um, about whom, about the trade union or the, the, the trade unionist, the first individual to have provided solidarity with, with uh, money or Lech Wałęsa with money in August or September 1980, and I quote um, my, my authors in my introduction, at least five authors claim to be <laughs> <laughs> that their country was the first one, or their trade unions were the first ones to have uh, provided solidarity with money. There's this competition um, which I didn't want to um, give the final uh, opinion about, and therefore I focused on um, reasons uh, rather than, than, uh, than money and uh, amounts. Okay. Piotr, any final thoughts? Sure. Uh, well, I see the, the Catholic issues didn't get much traction, but uh, <laughs> I wanted to go back to the generational question, actually, for a second, because um, I, I think I agree completely with, with Greg's point that certainly the, 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 the sense of whether you were immediate post-war immigre or if you had emigrated in the 60s or 70s or 80s to Western Europe would have completely changed the profile when it comes to inclination toward uh, solidarity with solidarity uh, within the diaspora, but also so I would say, and this is, I think, actually maybe a key research question for the next sort of next layer of work in here. My sense, just from having done a lot of oral history with Catholic activists who then bled over into solidarity and its supporting organizations on the Western European end, is that the, the last generation that is 100 percent totally committed to this uh, at the level at least of management or the, the leadership is the generation born between, say, 1925 and 1935 or 1940. 
if you go any farther than that, I think that the the sense of affiliation or inclination towards solidarity with solidarity would change markedly. This is just a hypothesis. I don't have the empirical research to back that up uh, in any quantitative sense. But impressionistically, that's what I've been getting. And I feel like it would be very interesting to pursue that kind of generational divide. Okay, well... I'll, um, I'll, I, oh. I wrote a ch separate chapter about it. I can uh, maybe. <laughs> what? Yeah, that's 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 a very long story. Um, well, I, I, I yeah? suggest maybe that's one we'll we'll have a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation there about uh -huh. the end. I I do want to, um, unless there's so. I mean, if you no, want to no, say no, something no, no, in no, a no, couple okay. sentences, yeah. fine. But uh, you know, I think we're just about out of time. So I'd like to bring this session. To a close, uh, was certainly one of the richest um, ones that I've had the privilege to chair this week, um, echoing the sentiment of, of Greg that this was really terrifically uh, productive and enlightening, and I learned a lot. Uh, the book is Solidarity with Solidarity. Uh, thanks to all of the panelists. Thank you for sticking around on this late Friday afternoon. And uh, let's give a round of applause to our panelists.